the epistle for Passion Sunday today here in Sparta, New Jersey, taken from St. Paul's letter to the Jews themselves, the Hebrews, chapter 9. Brethren, Christ being come, a high priest of the good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats or of calves, but by his own blood entered once into the holies, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and of oxen and the ashes of a heifer, being sprinkled, sanctify such as are defiled to the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the Holy Ghost offered himself immaculate to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And therefore he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of his death, for the redemption of those transgressions which were under the former testament, they that are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel. <clears throat> Taken from St. John chapter 8. At that time, Jesus said to the multitudes of the Jews, Which of you shall convince me of sin? If I say the truth to you, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth the words of God. Therefore you hear them not, because you are not of God. The Jews therefore answered and said to him, Do not we say well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you have dishonored me. But I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Amen, amen, I say to you, if any man keep my word, he shall not see death forever. <clears throat> the Jews therefore said, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, If any man keep my word, he shall not taste death forever. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom dost thou make thyself? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father that glorifieth me, of whom you say that he is your God. And you have not known him, but I know him. And if I shall say that I know him not, I shall be like to you a liar. But I do know him, do keep his word. Abraham your father rejoiced that he might see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews therefore said to him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? <clears throat> Jesus said to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, before Abraham was made, I am. They took up stones, therefore, to cast at him. <clears throat> but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. By way of announcement, next Sunday there will be Mass here. It will be Palm Sunday Mass. We'll try to have a high Mass and a procession. And it's a, we'll be chanting the whole Passion according to St. Matthew. So it's a very long chant, it's a very long ceremony. But uh, we enter into the very suffering of our Divine Lord. So for us it should be exciting, it should be so great. It's the it's the most important event. And if people can stand in lines for hours and hours to go shopping, if people can sit hours and hours in front of video games, and if people can sit for hours and hours, even in, in freezing weather, which does happen at uh, the NFL stadium for NFL games, and for hours, three, four, five hours, with no complaint, and no yawning. <laughs> we can give all our attention and all our love to our the most important event, which is the redemption and the sacrifice of our Lord on the cross. So come to Palm Sunday. What time will it? One o'clock. One o'clock in the afternoon. So come on Palm Sunday, and uh, there'll be confessions, of course. And as soon as confessions are over, come to the mass. 
and bring some friends, bring your enemies, bring them to see the great ceremonies of Mother Church in her sacred tradition. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The epistle of this Mass speaks of Christ as the High Priest. And this High Priest is prefigured by David, the King. And David, as a young boy, washed the sheep. He was born in Bethlehem. And out of his lineage will come the Redeemer a thousand years later. And, Jesus, and, and David the king prefigures the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. As St. Augustine will say, the words of David are the words of Christ. The words of the Psalms are the words of the Sacred Heart. If you want to know the, the mind of the Sacred Heart of our Lord, read and pray and meditate on the Psalms. And the Virgin Mary knew the Psalms by heart. Our Lord wrote them. They chanted them together in the Holy Family, St. Joseph, Our Lady, and all the Jews, the average Jews, the average family, even today the so-called traditional Jews who still reject our divine Lord, but even they know the Psalms by heart. They just have lost the meaning. But we know the meaning, and they're fulfilled in the very suffering, the passion, death, resurrection of our Lord, and the fulfillment of all the prophecies in our divine Lord. So our Lord Jesus Christ is foretold in David, and David, as a young man, killed lions with his bare hands. He shot with his sling, and he was certainly very good with his sling, as we would see later with, when he faces Goliath. He had a very accurate shot. And he had killed lions, he had killed bear with his sling, with his bare hands, to protect his flock, to protect his sheep. Later, St. David will be taken into the, the realm of the king, the first king of Israel, King Saul. And the king will ask David to play his harp. And David would sing the psalms, playing the harp. Because when Saul the king was troubled by the devils, the music and the singing of these sacred words would drive the devil away and ease the soul of the king. But the king allowed the devil to get into his heart by jealousy. Because after some battles, David proved to be a great warrior. And he was young, he was strong, he was handsome. And he slayed many more than Saul in battle. So when they came back from war, after being bloodstained and sweaty and tired and exhausted and hungry and thirsty, they would come back to the city, into the city walls. And all the girls would be out there on the city walls like, like a whole pack of cheerleaders, they would be singing as written in scripture, David has, Saul killed a thousand, David, or Saul killed hundreds, but David killed thousands. David killed thousands, and they sung to David, and they all loved David, and, Je and Saul got jealous. Envy entered his heart, and he should have been happy for this this, this young man who loved our Lord and who was good and who was promising and who loved the law of God and sang to God and wrote hymns to God inspired by the Holy Ghost. But, he, but jealousy entered his heart. And one time St. David was playing the harp and the king Saul allowed the devil to get into him. He picked up his lance and threw it with full force to kill him. And David, by the corner of his eye, dodged the arrow, and it went into the wall right in front of him, ricocheting and uh, vibrating in front of his face. So David got the message, and he fled. And the whole story goes much longer. But, but let it be said, what St. Augustine and St. John Chrysostom say about this, David plays the harp, and he prefigures Christ, who also plays the harp. And the music of Christ will be most beautiful. And David will play this harp, which is made, it's called the chitara. It was a, like a miniature harp with wooden frame and ten strings. And the strings are tightened like a guitar or a violin, tightened so the music, and when it's plucked, 
It hits the right note. So says St. Augustine, our Lord is the one. He is the true David who played the true harp on Golgotha. And his whole aim in his life was for that hour when he will sing this new canticle of himself on the cross. And on the cross he will intone like the high priest will do at Mass. He will intone Psalm 21. And that psalm, he was so breathless and so filled with agony and pain and suffering and sorrow, he would only intone it. But all the Jews who were there mocking him, and the Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross, and St. John, and St. Mary Magdalene, and Mary of Salome, they knew what our Lord meant. Psalm 21, my God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? That intones the psalm, but the rest of the psalm is all prophetic speaking of his abandonment, surrounded by fat dogs and bulls, kicked and spit upon, a worm and not a man, and nailed to the tree of the cross. They've pierced my hands and my feet. They've numbered all my bones. And upon my vestments they will cast dice. But, but he also speaks about in that psalm the spreading of the Catholic faith throughout the world. And those who are hungry will be filled, filled with his flesh, filled with his divine heart and holy communion and with his grace. So this new song and this harp is Christ, says St. Saint Saint John Chrysostom and St. Augustine. Why? Because the strings of the harp were always, like the old-fashioned tennis rackets, were always made of cat guts. Before the animal rights people got up, up in arms, they used to be made of cat guts because they were the best and animal guts that were stretched out and they were perfect for the plucking of the music. So, says St. John Chrysostom, our Lord, his guts were spread out and stretched on the cross. So horribly stretched that when they yanked his, I think it's his left arm, yes, his left arm, or maybe his right, I forget now. Uh, I think it's his left, but I can stand corrected. But whichever arm was yanked, so that it pulled out of its socket, not broken, but dislocated. Dislocated right out of his shoulder. This is extremely painful. And then nailed to the cross, because the holes were wider than his body could, could sustain. They, and our Lord was big, so they expected a, a broader a, a length arm span. But they had to yank his arm and dislocate his shoulder. So our Lord literally was stretched out on the cross. His guts were stretched out on the cross. And this stretching is the strings. And then the, the frame of this harp is the wood of the cross to which Christ was nailed. And that's why in the psalm, which is highlighted in the mass and dropped at the foot of the altar, says, I will go. I will go unto the altar of God, to God who gives joy to my youth. And I will ascend the mountain, and, uh, and on the mountain, in Montem Santentum, and in Tabernacle Tua. I will ascend your mountain and sing to you. And Christ is saying this. He's the one that will ascend the mountain of the altar of Calvary, and he will sing the new chant, the new Canticum Novum, the new hymn to the glory of the Father. And the most beautiful hymn, the most beautiful song, which is the redemption. Christ on the cross, the living God in the flesh, butchered on the cross, bleeding and, and panting for air and thirsting for souls. And his heart broken like wax, melted in his heart, the wax that's poured out. And literally poured out when this heart was pierced. He poured out the last drops of blood and water. This is the new song, most pleasing to all the angels and to God the Father. And it was a song that would pay for our sins and open the gates of heaven and snatch millions from hell. And this is Christ, the high priest, singing this new song on the altar. And this is the high priest, Brethren, Christ being come, a high priest of the good things to come, 
by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, no longer anymore the tabernacle of the Old Testament, which was the temple in Jerusalem. And when Christ died at 3 o'clock, the massive earthquake shattered the temple, cracked it, and did damage to it. And the temple was ripped from, from the top to the bottom, and it was 60 feet high, this, this temple curtain, this veil of thick material. So it was as if God was ripping the Old Testament ceremonies are over. Now it's fulfilled in my divine Son. And the cross fulfills all the Old Testament bloodshed, sacrifices, the butchering of the lambs. Remember, any time a Jew would hear the words lamb or sheep, unlike us moderns who think of a Walmart stuffed animal that squeaks, but in those days when they heard lamb or sheep, they immediately thought smoke, blood, sprinkling of blood, ashes, and the priest offering the sacrifice to God. Because every single year, every Jewish family had to travel to Jerusalem during Passover and be there to pay for a sacrifice of animals. Most of them paid for, for sheep. And the, and the commentators say that there were up to two, 250,000 sheep marching into Jerusalem, being herded in to the temple to be sacrificed by the priests. The priests, day and night, were offering the sacrifices. Blood on them, smoke, burning, the smell of flesh, roasting, and like a barbecue. And sometimes the, the priests had to eat the flesh. Sometimes they had to burn everything in the entrails. And there were strict laws regarding the sacrifice, according to God's commands. And St. Justin tells us there's one as part of the ceremony and the sacrifice of a lamb where the high priest would take it, drive a stake up the back into the, up to the neck and another stake through the arms. So the lamb looked like it was really hanging on a cross. And since the child Jesus, when he was one, two, three, four, five years old, coming with the Virgin Mary, they saw this. And Christ knew exactly what it was for. Our Lady knew exactly what it was for, so did St. Joseph. Our Lady must have wept, tears, fountains of tears, every time going to Jerusalem during the childhood of our Lord. She must have already been already the mother of sorrow. She knew exactly what it was pointing to. And the high priest would take that lamb, lower it over the flames until it was partially roasted, and then hold it up for all to see. For all the crowds to see. And what they see was a half roasted lamb, bleeding, partially white with wool, partially burnt black by the smoke and flame, and bleeding. Exactly how Christ would look on the cross, mangled and butchered by the scourging, the crowding of thorns, the flies crawling all over him, his muscles bulging in great pain because they're contracting from the sweat and the loss of blood and the cold chill already on Golgotha because it's already dark by noon. It's pitch black. There's no light. It's the eclipse of the sun for three hours. This has never been witnessed in human history, but it's recorded even by historians in Spain and in Egypt. They record this eclipse. They record the earthquake. And Christ, the cold chill, makes his muscles con contract. And the, just to breathe on the cross is an agonizing process just to get one breath. To get one breath, the splinters in his ripped up back and then pushing down on the nails in his feet that cut through 22 nerves. And then the nails that cut through the median nerve in his wrist. And then his hand nailed through. And to breathe, he had to scrape his mangled back with the raw nerves exposed into the wood. The crown of thorns pushed into the back of his head pushing all the thorns all over his head, which formed a huge helmet. 
and reopening all the blood of the head wounds, and the head wounds bleed the most. Just to get a breath, our Lord had to push up on the nails, pull down on the nails on the hands, which sent shock waves of pain throughout his body. And then whistling in one breath, and then relaxing, to let the breath out, and then to breathe in again, that whole process. An agony of such pain for three hours. And this is the great new song. The new song, the Canticum Novum. Why is it a new song? And why is it so sweet to the Father? Because it's His only begotten Son, who He loved more than anything. He loves His divine Son. And the whole reason for this cross is out of love for souls, to save our souls from burning in hell forever. That's why. And for those who will love our Lord and, and hear His word and keep it, that is, listen to the word of God through preaching, through our catechism instruction, from our mother's knee to sermons to catechisms <coughs> to hearing them, since faith comes by hearing, and not only listening it, but doing the actions, really living the charity we're commanded to, to have. Charity not just to our family and those we live with, charity to those who hate us, charity to those who are our neighbors, charity to those we work with, Charity those who we meet in the public place. We're commanded to have a great a, a charity like Christ had, which was the willingness even to die for those who love us, but even to die for those who hate us. And if you're killed by those who hate us, to forgive those who kill us. And it's easy for me to say, but it's another story when you're into that. When the one torturing you, you're praying for, and all the saints, the martyrs of England, the martyr of St. Stephen, St. Lawrence, right before they died, they were praying for their, the ones torturing them, and they forgave them. That's what we need to be. Not just have, but be. Be the heart of Jesus, who wants to live in us by his grace. So this Mass, with the introit intoned by the eternal high priest on the cross. He is the priest. Christ is the priest. And the Mass is exactly the same. The, the physical priest, the person, the human being, is another Christ. St. Thomas uses a powerful, strong word when speaking of the Catholic priesthood. He calls it a quasi-hypostatic union and should make us priests tremble with fear because of our judgment. And pray for your priests, especially this one, pray that we will have a fearful judgment when we die. Because priests are more heavily judged by God than lay people. Fathers of families, who are the head of their family, are more heavily judged than the wife because he's the head. So the priest, and what about a bishop? Frightful thought. What about a pope? My, a pope. What a judgment. So Christ, he is in the Mass, the priest is, is, is with Christ, offering himself in the sacrifice. And that's why the, the Catholic priest is, is celibate. That's why he's married to Christ. That's why he takes the vow of chastity. Because he's like a chalice given to God. And, and Christ wants this. And they're attacking this again. And even Pope Francis has introduced the idea of a married clergy, which is forbidden in the Roman rite. It's forbidden. And there's a reason for this, which is not because the priest is just too busy. It's better if he's not married. Well, in that case, doctors and lawyers shouldn't be, be married either, because they're busier sometimes than priests. But the reason is, like the Virgin Mary, they call down God from heaven to the altar. And they must be consecrated to God like a chalice, like the Virgin Mary, virgin <coughs> and mother. The priest is chaste, virgin, and offers the sacrifice, like the Virgin Mary. So this is the priest who offers the Mass, Jesus Christ, with the physical priest that offers the Mass. And he is the victim also. In the Old Testament, it was animals. But in the New Testament, it's Christ himself, his body sacrificed on the cross. And that's why Virgin Mary, 
She's called co-redemptrix. That's why she's called co-mediatrix. Because what was her role in preparing the victim? She prepared the matter. She prepared the material. She, she gave Christ, God, the invisible God, she gave God the hands to be nailed to the cross. She gave him by her blood from her most pure heart his feet to be nailed to the cross. She formed in her womb by the power of the Holy Ghost all the ligaments, the nerves, the, the bones, the blood, and the very most perfect body of Christ that would be scourged and raked with the scourges, crowned with thorns, beaten all the way to Calvary, Cal Calvary, and nailed to the cross. That's the one where who prepared the matter, who prepared the lamb to be sacrificed? The Virgin Mary. So it is so illogical and so blasphemous and so contrary to the will of Christ to deny these titles to the Virgin Mary which fit her and belong to her. And that's another curse on Vatican II because Vatican II refused to please the Protestants. They refused to pronounce Mary as mediatrix of all graces, as co-redemptrix. And many good Catholic bishops, among them Archbishop Lefebvre, pleaded with the Holy Father, please declare these. It's time for Mother Mary to be honored with these titles. And they refused, because they knew it would upset the Protestants and the Lutherans. So there's a condemnation of Vatican II, if you haven't heard that one yet. That alone suffices to condemn it. So our Blessed Mother, she gave us the victim. And the victim is Christ on the altar. The victim is Christ on the cross, which is reenacted on the altar in an unbloody manner. And where is the altar? The altar is the cross, the wooden cross. Isaac carried the wood that, that Abraham built the altar with on Mount Moriah, which is the same <coughs> mountain chain as Golgotha. <clears throat> and Abraham was going to sacrifice his, his son he loved so much, his only son. He was going to sacrifice him obeying God's strange orders. He was going to sacrifice him on the wood of the altar on Mount Calvary. 2,000 years before Christ would come, Abraham was. But Abraham was stopped by the angel before he thrust the heart into his son. And he was spared that terrible sadness and tragedy of having to sacrifice his son. He was, he was spared from that. And some of the saints, when Christ says, Abraham saw my day and was glad, there's about five opinions on this, explanations. But one of them is that Abraham saw in a vision Christ on the cross, that God would become man and die on the cross, on that very same mountain, on the wood of the cross. And he saw that day and rejoiced, because he got to spare his son, but God the Father would not spare his most beloved son. And when we talk about only begotten son, most beloved son, the eternal generation of the son from the Father in the Blessed Trinity, when we touch these mysteries far above us, we cannot even imagine the love of God that exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We just can't even begin to imagine. And the most beautiful things on this earth, the sunset, the snow on the mountain caps, a beautiful sunrise, birds chirping, and the breeze of the summer winds, and the flowers and blossoms on the trees, and the pine trees with their pine smell, and seeing a herd of deer, Marching through the woods, a delight for many hunters sitting in their tree stands. And just to see dolphins <clears throat> jumping out of the sea. Our scuba divers who go down and see a whole new world of color and colorful fish. <clears throat> Everything in this world that speaks of beauty, it does, or there's the smile of a newborn baby. The smile, the beauty of a mother. And a young couple with a baby, and many babies and children, and a, a large family. There's something more beautiful. Or the beauty of an old couple, faithful to their marriage vows. 
or even more beautiful, an old nun faithful to her vows, or an old priest faithful to tradition, let alone an old good Catholic bishop like Archbishop Lefebvre. There's something beautiful in these things. And yet, the most strong love between a husband and wife, a mother and child, it doesn't even touch the love. We can't even imagine the love in the Blessed Trinity. But so great is the love of the Father and the Son that aspirates the third person without a beginning of time, a person, the Holy Ghost, who is the person of love. Of course, we're talking something so far above us, but let it be made the point that Abraham didn't have to kill his son, but God did give his, own, his only begotten son to be butchered on the cross in the most cruel <coughs> death for the love of our souls. And that's why the crucifix shouts out the love of God. That's why it needs to be in every home. It shouts out the love of God. <clears throat> it's got to be on our White House. It's got to be on our legal documents of our country. And on our flag, it shouts out the love of God. This is what he wants. And it's a crime to remove his cross, his crucifix. It's a crime to remove his crucifix from the public place, from the flag. It's a crime. And it's a shame for the Notre Dame priests in charge of Notre Dame University. When Obama visited there a few years ago, they made a point to remove the crucifix and cover them to their shame. And those priests will have a lot to answer when they stand before Christ. So our dear Lord, he is that high priest, entering into the Holy of Holies, not with the blood of goats and animals, but by his own blood, open the gates of heaven. And this blood is so precious. St. Alphonsus says if Christ just took a pin, squeezed out one drop of blood, it would redeem the whole human race and a million human races. But he knew, he knew that we would not be too convinced, would we? And even after all he suffered, souls are still not convinced because sin hardens the heart. Sin brings us into darkness. And those who love the sin in darkness, they don't like the light. But we need, we must, we must pray to love the light. Christ is that light. And like the light that shines through the windows here and illuminates the whole room with a brighter light than the electrical light, so much brighter is the light of Christ to the earthly light, the earth we have in the sun that he created. He outshines it by millions of watts, if I could put it that way. And he is that light that shines in the darkness. And souls who cut off that light by blocking the windows of grace and shutting out and live in darkness by sin. They live in darkness and walk in darkness and pray for their conversion, pray for poor souls. But we children of the light, we must love this light, thirst for this light, and drink from this fountain, which is the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, poured out on the cross. And this is what our Lord wants. Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, we can count our burdens, we can count our labors, we can count our tears and woes and thorns in this life, how many there are. Come to me and I will refresh you, our Lord said. For my burden, my yoke is sweet, and my burden is light. And he, there's nothing any of us could suffer that he didn't suffer himself. And as we go through this passion of the Catholic Church, betrayed by her bishops, denied by her Pope, and uh, raped and re-crucified by all the sins of the world, and uh, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the mystical body of Christ, suffering this agony and this scourging in this age of apostasy, let's stand next to the Virgin Mary, faithful to who Christ is. That's all. That's the reason why we're here, because we proclaim that Christ is God, he is king, and he's the only eternal high priest who offers the only prayer pleasing to God, and that's the Mass. Is God pleased with Protestant services, with all their clapping and singing hallelujah? No. 
Is God pleased with the new Mass, with all its mockery and abuses? No. Is God pleased with even Latin Masses offered by priests who insult him and, and compromise against him, against his priesthood, his kingship, his divinity, by accepting Vatican II and the new Mass, even in the most minuscule way? Those offend God very much, even though the Mass might be valid. Those compromising priests offend him. So, this Mass, in this holy faith, we got to stand by with the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin Mary proclaims the kingship of Christ, because he's king on that cross. She proclaims his priesthood, because she's the mother that prepared the body that would be the victim on the cross. She's the mother of that victim. And she's the one that died with him and suffered with him in her heart, was martyred with him on the, on the wood of the cross. So when we suffer in this time of the crisis of the church, an agony, and it is an agony, we all suffer it. We all long for a day when the Pope will proclaim the kingship of Christ again and condemn the errors that are destroying the church we, and consecrate Russia. We long for that day. We long for the day when he will excommunicate all these real criminals and bishops in the church who are destroying the sheepfold and letting the wolves tear apart the sheep and take them to hell. We long for that day when there will be once again good Catholic bishops who will just do their Episcopal duties and priests who will do be good priests and not modernist liberals and liberal Catholic spine, spineless jellyfish and bunny rabbits, but priests who proclaim the whole truth. And that is the kingship of Christ over all nations, over our White House, on our flag, on our Constitution. Christ is king and he must be recognized at the social political level. And that means this, the laws of the country must be supporting the Ten Commandments, which means the laws must forbid abortion, must forbid divorce, must forbid the sodomites, must forbid the evolution and atheism in public school education, etc., etc., etc. And the list is long. So we got to fight on and we got to humble ourselves, knowing that myself first, we're all to blame for this bloody crucifixion of our Lord. We're all guilty. We're all guilty. The Romans instrumentally nailed him to the cross. The Jews called for his crucifixion and crucified him by their tongues. Let him be crucified, they shouted. But we were also all there by our sins, by my sins. And if this was a saint up here preaching, he'd be weeping like St. Bernard, weeping for his sins. So we were all there. And Christ on the cross, he's God. He saw us. He saw all of us in our soul, in our heart, in our inmost depths of our being. He saw us already from the cross. Because he's God. It's no problem for him to peer into the future. He knows. So he saw us there. But if we saw us there nailing him and scourging him, let him see also us there weeping for our sins, making reparation for our sins, begging his pardon, and mercy, and confessing our sins by good confessions to him through his priest in the Holy Sacrament of Confession. So prepare your souls for this coming, these next few weeks of the Passion of our Lord, Holy Week, and then the Great Resurrection, Easter Week. And follow close the, 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 the treasures and the good wine of Mother Church in the missals. And let's ask the Mother of God to give us the grace to stand with her at the foot of the cross, opposing all, she's an enemy to ecumenism. The mother of God is an enemy to modernism. She's an enemy of Protestantism and Lutheranism. She's an enemy to all that attacks her son. She's an enemy to Vatican II and the New Mass. She hates Vatican II and the New Mass. She sees it taking so many to hell, destroying the flock of our Lord. And she is an enemy to all this. She's an enemy to evolution, which is being now promoted by the new SSPX. A major downfall for the SSPX to pro be promoting the Big Bang Theory and excusing it like it was an acceptable idea. 
and it was formulated by a modernist Catholic priest who lost the faith, Father Joseph Metra from France in the 1920s. He invented, he invented the Big Bang Theory, a Catholic priest, like another Judas. And then there was another Catholic priest, Father Teilhard de Chardin, who was condemned six times by Pius XII. And he went to the Far East, found a bone, and proclaimed it to be the missing link that Darwin was looking for, the link that would connect apes and monkeys to the human race. And a lot of people believed it, and many seminarians and priests and bishops said, wow, the church was wrong. The church must have been wrong all these years. Genesis is wrong. And St. Pius X hammered these modernists, nailed them in 65 theses, pounding their errors, every one of them. And he condemns those who try to say that the Catholic dogmas need to evolve and be shaped to modern science. False. What happens? Turns out Father Teilhard de Chardin's so-called missing link bone, when honest scientists actually studied it, they scratched their head and said, this man was a fool. This thing is chiseled and it's dyed with stain. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. Just like all the arguments of evolution are all lies and hoaxes. They have not one proof for their evolutionary lies. And yet they shove this down the throats of college students and even children in the grade schools. And they know it's lies. They know it's lies. But we swim in lies, and the, and the scripture says about our days, they will be given to love the lie and abandon the truth. So let us not fall for these lies. Stand firm in the faith. To stand firm in the faith of Archbishop Lefebvre, who handed us the great teachings of our great popes, who were saints and warriors, who proclaimed the kingship of Christ and his priesthood and his divinity. Oh, that's all the popes from Pius XII and before. And all these great popes condemned Vatican II, the new mass, modernism, <clears throat> socialism, evolution, and all these errors. They're all condemned. So we got to restudy these. We got to re-meditate on these things. We got to rediscover our Catholic faith, because our catechism up to eighth grade is not enough. And that's the problem with modern Catholics in the last fifty years. We think, well, I know my Baltimore Catechism. I've gone through Baltimore Catechism one, two, and three, so I'm all set for life. No, you're not, because you got to understand why evolution is evil and it's a lie. You got to fight communism and the communist ideas that we're soaked in right now. You got to fight the modern errors of modernism and attacks on scripture and our tradition of the church. How do you defend these things? You've got to read the Catholic counter revolution. You got to read the works of Archbishop Lefebvre, especially they have uncrowned him. You got to read the works of Father Dennis Fay, who exposes the Judeo Masonic control over the banking systems. And even the food, the way the food is being denutralized and de, de gmo and all this. He already spoke about this in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, then the other great works of Cardinal P. Well, he's in French, but he's being slowly translated. And then the great works, the Old Angeles magazine. The Old Angeles magazines before 2012, they're great. They're great. There's some dynamite articles in there, and old, the bulldog, old Father Peter Scott, <laughs> and old Father Ken Novak, who should be with the resistance, who should be fighting in the line of Archbishop Lefebvre, but they're going along with the compromise, pray for them, but they used to write dynamite articles. Dynamite. And these will strengthen your faith. When you go back to read them, you're going to say, wow, that's the old SSPX. That's the one I knew, not this new neutralized one. The old, the old SSPX. So, anyway, let's stand next to the Virgin Mary. Let's beg her, the mother of sorrows, the sorrows we will never comprehend, and ask her to give us a little spark of her divine love of her son, so that we will love him more than anything, more than ourselves, more than anything, love our Lord and love the holy truths that not are just his in a book, but are him, 
He is the seven sacraments. Because they come from the sacred heart. He is the seven sacraments. They're not definitions in a book. They are Christ. The twelve articles of the creed. They are the blessed trinity and the redemption. That's what it's about. And all about our Catholic faith. It's summed up in one word. Christus. Christus. Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. Jesus Christ. He is it. He's the word from all eternity. Summed up in one word. Christus. The hypostatic union. So let's go and adore him now on the altar. Receive him on our knees asking a great love for him. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. Father, Son, Holy Ghost.